There he is. Jordan, are you? That's you, right? Thanks for bringing the. Very special Good Friday communion service. Tonight is just going to be an incredible night in the presence of the Lord. I've been here the last few hours and I've seen what the team has prepared in our worship and our time together. It's going to be an amazing service. It's going to be a little bit different tonight. In, in just a little bit, we're going to go into a time of adoration. There's going to be some special dances and some really amazing components to the service tonight. But what we're going to do is, in just a minute, we're going to start off, and it may sound different, but we're going to start off with one song of praise, amen? And then, we're, then I'm going to come back out here, and then we're going to transition into the rest of the service. I want to welcome right now all of those that are watching from around the world on our online congregation. Thank you so much for joining Nations Church here for our Good Friday service. Nations Church, why don't you give them a great big God bless you and welcome. Amen. Now, now, come on, let's stand to our feet. We're going to start with praising our King Jesus tonight. Amen. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, can you lift up a big shout of praise in this room tonight? Hallelujah. Come on, lift up a shout of praise in this room tonight. Yes, Lord. We will not be shaken. Come on, put those hands together. We will not be moved. For the Lord is beside us, with Him we cannot lose, though the shadow surrounds us, we will fear no evil, we'll trust in the Lord with our hearts.
can bring our joy to life We won't submit to sorrow Our joy is coming in the morning Yes, Lord In the morning Come on, let's raise it up I said joy is coming, amen? Hallelujah. Well, you can make your way to your seats. Actually, before you're seated, why don't you turn around and greet two or three people tonight to the house of the Lord. There's not many opportunities for us to have an evening service. So good to see you tonight. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Sunday's on its way, amen? Praise Jesus, praise Jesus. Well, we, once again, we want to welcome you tonight to Nations Church. Those of you just making your way in, you're welcome here. Again, if you're watching online from all over the world, thank you. Stay tuned. Tonight is going to be special. Don't scroll by, but stay plugged into what the Lord's going to do in this service Tonight, if you're a first-time visitor, thank you so much for being here and coming. We pray that you are blessed. Well, this weekend is such a, an amazing and special time, amen? Of course, tonight with Good Friday and reflecting on the cross, reflecting on the sacrifice of our Savior, but also Sunday, of course, we can't wait for our Easter services, and we want to remind you we have Three services Sunday, 7 a.m., our resurrection service at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And I want to encourage you, if you're not sure what service you're going to come to, if I can kind of encourage you to come to the 9 a.m., 
If you like to find a seat, no, just kidding. It's good. No, it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be great. We're going to have a lot of visitors, and that's amazing. But we have three amazing options to choose from, so we can make sure everyone has a seat. Seven, nine, and eleven. On your way out, you've probably seen these over the last couple of weeks. Grab some flyers. Invite somebody to our Easter services. And everybody said, "Amen, Amen." Well, real quick, I want to take up our offering tonight. We're going to do this now, so we can jump into worship and we can jump into uh, communion and the preaching of the word. But re, re, in reality, this is as much part of worship as anything we're going to do tonight. And tonight I want to ask us, you know, that we're not giving to a man tonight. We're not even giving to a church. We're not giving to a vision. Tonight we're giving to the Lord Jesus Christ. I really felt that today as I was reflecting on the offering that as we come and as we give, we give an offering unto Jesus. And it's in the form of money, but what is that? That's, that's our substance. That's our first fruit. That, that is what we put our work into, our time into. Many of you just got off of work and you rushed here tonight to be part of that. We say thank you, but when you work and you get paid, you know, that check or that dollar represents your sweat. It represents your hard work. It represents those things that you're doing. And when you give an offering, you're saying, God, I'm offering this to you. I'm giving you my work. I'm giving you my sweat. I'm giving you my worship in the form of money. And the Lord blesses that. So tonight we're going to do it a little bit differently because it is Good Friday. I really felt like we needed to make an offering to Jesus tonight. And I want everyone that will or everyone that can to participate in this special Good Friday offering. What we're going to do in just a minute, and there's all the ways to give you see on the screen. If you're watching online, you can participate in this Good Friday offering right where you're at. The information's on the screen. But here you can see the ways to give to my right and to my left. And what I want to do tonight in just a minute is we're all going to participate, and then as the worship begins to play, because tonight, offering is worship. I really want us to get that. What we're going to do with our offering is we're actually going to come up. There's a basket here, and there's a basket to my left and to your right, and I want us to give that special offering to the Lord tonight. I want to make this an act of worship that on this Good Friday, God, I'm coming to you with you, Lord, with my songs, yes, I'm coming to you with my praise and my hands lifted up. But God, tonight I'm also coming to you with my substance, with, with, with my finances, with my trust, with my work. And I'm making that offering to you tonight. Now I want everyone to participate in this, but many times, you know, we give online and, and we really don't have something like tangible to, to give when we do that, which I give online as well. But what I want you to do is if you're giving online tonight, I want you to get an envelope, and then I want you to write what you're giving online in that envelope. So, you know, I'm giving a special Good Friday gift tonight, and I put my name on there, and I just put the amount on there that I'm giving online. This way, when we participate, we can all step forward in our worship, and we can sow that seed together, that we can worship the Lord with our giving. Can everyone say Amen. So let's do that now. If you're making out a check, you can do that. You can give on the ways on the screen. But if you're giving online, Cash App, Venmo, Zelle, on the church app, however you're giving tonight, I want you to take an envelope, and we have pens as well. Write that number on the envelope, and then you're going to come in just a minute. Amen? Let's do this. I'm going to pray over the offering tonight, and then the musicians are going to begin to play. And then we're going to come and we're going to sow our seeds and we're going to worship the Lord in our giving. If you need an envelope, the ushers are still coming. Just keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. And if you're done already writing your check or writing the amount online, just hold those envelopes up into the Lord as a sign of worship. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. Lord, you've been so good to us. God, you've been so good to us. You've been so faithful, Lord. Everything is yours, God. Everything is yours. And tonight, as I worship you in my giving, in my offering, Lord, I trust you. 
Lord, you know every need in my life, in my family, and in my ministry. And tonight, I give this to you as a sign of my trust and as a form of worship unto you, King Jesus. Lord, you are not just my, my Lord, not just my Savior. God, you're my source of everything. You're my source, and I worship you in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. Let's stand up to our feet right now, and let's come forward, and let's worship the Lord with our giving tonight. Amen. Come on, worship team, as we're giving, let's worship the Lord.
God, we thank you for your blood tonight. Ooh. Come on, let's thank him in this room. You are good, God. Thank you for the price that you paid, God. Oh, thank you for the price you paid. Yeah. Come on, let's sing it together. I said, I'm so glad I've been washed. The blood, the blood of the Lamb. So
that I've been watching the blood say the blood the blood on the land I'm so glad so glad I've been watched I've been watching the blood in come on one more time everybody say the blood Worship him right here. We're grateful, we're grateful, we're grateful. We are thankful, God. Thank you for washing us, oh God. Your blood washed me white as snow.
lion of the tribe of Judah. Let's lift our hands. There is one found worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah. There is one found worthy, the root of David and God. so beautiful. You're so beautiful. Lord, we look at you tonight. We fix our gaze on you, Jesus. The cross, the blood, the body broken for me, for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence kissing us tonight. We love you. We honor you. We honor you tonight. In Jesus' name. In the presence of the Lord tonight, we're going to take of the Lord's table. Millions upon millions of Christians, dare I say a billion Christians or more all over the world are celebrating this sacred day together, Good Friday. The day we remember the broken body and the shed blood of our Savior, God Almighty, Jesus Christ. But do we realize at this same time, not only are a billion Christians recognizing that, but the Jewish people all over the world are celebrating even this night, the Passover. Even this night as I, see, as I speak, they're celebrating the Passover Seder. Even as we are together right now, they're looking at the lamb and remembering the Passover lamb that was slain and the blood that was applied to the doorposts of the house so that they may be saved. Even right now as I gather, they're breaking bread together. Even right now as I speak, they're holding up the cup of redemption in the Seder and they're drinking of the cup. It was on this night and in this occasion, Jesus celebrated, the Bible says, the Passover meal with his disciples. And during that Passover Seder, which they're very familiar of and celebrated their entire lives, and that the Jewish people up until that point were celebrating for 2,000 years, 
Jesus celebrated the night that he was betrayed, the Bible says. The night before the cross, he celebrated that Passover meal. And then he took the bread that they were all too familiar with, and he said, this that you've celebrated your entire lives, this represents, this is my body broken for you. And I believe their eyes were opened. And then Jesus, during the Passover Seder, he took the cup of redemption that they celebrated every year of their lives, and he held that cup of redemption, and he said, this is my blood that is poured out for you in the new covenants. Isn't that amazing? And I pray tonight as we celebrate the body and the blood that this is not some religious, ritualistic, symbolic act, but as we celebrate the body of Jesus broken and the blood of Jesus, his presence is with us. His grace is with us and available, amen? We're gonna receive the body and blood tonight together as a family. If you have not received the elements, the ushers are making their way around. I wanna read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. The apostle Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I want to just take a moment tonight. I think it's altogether fitting and proper that we would come to the Lord's table on Good Friday. I want to take a moment to just examine ourselves as the Apostle Paul encourages us to do in 1 Corinthians. To just take a moment and to reflect a prayer of examine to just come before the Lord as we're here in his presence tonight and just to let the Holy Spirit move in our hearts as we prepare ourselves to receive the body and blood of Christ. Let's take a moment now. Jesus, we love you tonight. We just pray, Holy Spirit, we invite you in to this place, not just this building or this room, but into our hearts to examine us. Lord, I just pray that you would examine our heart, examine our motives. We just pray that tonight that our eyes would be fixed on you as we engage in this holy ordinance. We thank you for the body and the blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Together, let's take the bread, the body of Christ and receive it together. Let us take the cup, the blood of Jesus poured out for you. Let's take it together. Thank you, Jesus. 
Let's just thank Jesus and worship him. Well, I greet you in the name of Jesus tonight. What a joy it is to be able to celebrate together uh, this incredible moment, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we know that his death is not the end of the story, but yet it is a moment for us to pause and to reflect and to consider how incredible this moment is. It really was the moment that split history into. And 
You know, I always say that Easter is the single most significant event in the history of the world, the resurrection from the dead, because of course the apostle Paul tells us that if Christ was not raised, then our faith is in vain and we're still in our sins. But if there's a close second moment that is in competition for the most significant moment in history, it would be this day that we celebrate right now, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if you'll just humor this old evangelist tonight as I endeavor to preach the gospel to you. Actually, when I consider the theme of the death of Christ, which is what we celebrate on Good Friday, I really can't see anything else but the gospel. And even if I could see something other than the gospel, I don't know that there's any other subject that I would consider to be worthy of this occasion. And so what I'd like to do in honor of this uh, celebration of this day, I'd like to read together corporately a longer portion of scripture that tells the story of part of the story of the death of Christ from the book of Luke chapter 23. And I wonder if we could all just stand and read this together out of respect for the word of God. And I'll have them put those, uh, the text up on the screen. This comes from the book of Luke chapter 23. And we begin reading in verse 26. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. We skip to verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do and they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals, who were hanged, railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly for what we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. You can be seated. I want to focus tonight on one particular story, part of the story of the crucifixion of Christ, which is the part about the thief on the cross. And you might think it's a little bit odd in, when we're talking about the death of Jesus to actually focus on one of the other people that was crucified with him. But I think you'll see how profound this is before the end of the evening. And let me just read one more scripture, if you don't mind. I'm sorry for using so much scripture while preaching the word. This comes from the book of John chapter six, verse 37. This is going to be my theme for tonight. These are the words of Jesus who said, all that the father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Let me read that last line again. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Here's another way of saying that. If someone comes to me, I will under no circumstances refuse him. Here's another way of saying that. If somebody comes to me, I will not reject them for any reason. Here's another way of saying that. If someone comes to me, I would never turn them away. And this is such an amazing thought that those who come to Jesus will never be turned away for any reason whatsoever. That means there is no other prerequisite, there is no other disqualifier, there is no other deal breaker, there is no other minimal requirement. And so on the one hand, if you come to Jesus, there is nothing that can disqualify you from receiving his mercy. Nothing you've done, no sin, no condemnation, nothing in your past, nothing can disqualify those that come to Jesus. And then on the other hand, if you don't come to Jesus, there is nothing you can do which would gain you one ounce of merit. 
You can't do, even if you did all the right things, you could say all the right things, you could go to church, you could get baptized and you could sing in the choir, you could give money in the offering. I love what Steve Hill used to say to the people in, in the Brownsville Revival. He would say, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. He would say, you can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can go to hell with a communion wafer in your hand. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. It doesn't matter how much money you put in the offering. It doesn't matter how much you fast. It doesn't matter how much you pray. If you don't come to Jesus, there is no other way to be saved. Can somebody say amen? amen. So here's the problem, uh, the, the promise, not the problem. The promise is if you come to him, he will not cast you out. You know, years ago, I applied for a life insurance policy, and I don't know if you've ever tried this before, but it was quite a lengthy and um, difficult process. They made me fill out a bunch of paperwork, a bunch of questionnaires, dozens of pages long. They asked questions about my medical history, about my family history, about my family's medical history. They asked about my current health. They asked about my habits and my lifestyle. I think they collected enough personal information on me to write a biography. And of course, as frustrating, as frustrating as that was, it's actually quite practical that they do this because if they don't do their due diligence as an insurance company, they're definitely not going to make a profit. I mean, imagine that I was a 95-year-old diabetic with heart disease and cancer on dialysis that loved to bungee jump and free dive that had recently come down with pneumonia and was applying for a 30-year term life insurance policy for $10 million. They would be guaranteed to lose if they signed up for that deal. And of course, the insurance company is wiser than that. But when you come to Jesus, here is the amazing thing. He doesn't try to deal with you to get something that's going to be profitable for him. He doesn't even ask about your history. You know, you think of the story of the, the prodigal son when he came to Jesus. You notice that the son wanted to confess what he had done when he ran away from his father's house and wasted his substance on riotous living, but the father didn't ask any questions. He didn't care about what the son had done. All that mattered to the father is that his son had come home. And this is the way that Jesus is with us. If we come to him, he's not looking at us and examining our teeth and doing a risk assessment and trying to see if based on our past, what he knows about us from our past or what's happening to us in our present, or even if what he knows about our future. How many of you know he's already taken your future failures into account? And even in spite of all that, knowing that you and I are going to mess up down the road, and not only knowing that we will mess up, but knowing exactly how and when we will mess up, he still says to us, if you will come to me, no matter what, I will not refuse you. And do you know why he doesn't do a risk assessment, my friends? Because he isn't afraid to lose. And do you know why he isn't afraid to lose? Because he was already the loser. And do you know why he was the loser? Because he wanted to win you. And you know how he wins you? He wins you when you come to him. You see, Jesus is not trying to get something out of you. He's not trying to make a profit off of you. You are not a means to an end for him. You are the end. He wins when you come to him. Jesus wants you, not because of what you can do for him, but he wants you because he loves you. And why does he love you, you may ask? Well, only God knows. <laughs> Actually, it's one of the greatest and most profound mysteries in all of history that Jesus loves us. That's why the hymn says that God should love a sinner such as I, should yearn to change my sorrow into bliss, not rest till he had planned to bring me nigh. How wonderful is love like this. And you know, let's talk a little bit about that thief on the cross. We'll come back to this passage from John chapter 6, but... The thief on the cross is, I think, one of the best illustrations of that passage. He that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Why? Because when it comes to the thief on the cross, you know, there's probably nobody in Scripture that was more helpless than this guy. His hands were literally nailed down. You know what that means? He couldn't do anything for Jesus. And not only that, his feet were nailed down, so he couldn't even kneel at Jesus' feet. He was at the very end of his life. He had just probably a few more hours to live. So he couldn't even give Jesus his life. This guy had nothing to offer Jesus, and yet Jesus accepted him. 
Let me paint this picture for you, or I will try to, because, you know, sometimes I think when we read these passages, especially if we've been in the church for a while, they just become routine, and they become familiar to us to the point that we miss the real human dynamic that's going on within the stories. We don't know very much about this guy. The Bible doesn't even tell us his name. But if we look carefully at not only the biblical story, but the the historical context that this happened in, there's a lot of things that we can be pretty safe to assume. For example, this man, whoever he was, this thief, he was living in a territory that was controlled by the Romans, but he himself was not a Roman. How do we know that? Well, because the Romans almost never crucified their own citizens. For the Romans, you know, if there had to be an execution, they would behead them because they considered beheading to be a much more dignified and gracious and merciful form of execution. But crucifixion was an intentionally cruel and humiliating form of execution that was reserved for the ones that the Romans considered to be the lowest of all classes of citizens, the non-citizens, the slaves, the rebels, those that had supposedly committed the most heinous crimes. And so this man, whoever he was, he was probably of a low social class. He was an outcast in his own land. He must have been poor. I mean, otherwise, why would he have been stealing? The Bible tells us that he was a thief. But just imagine how many and how severe his offenses must have been for a thief to deserve the death penalty. So this guy was probably not your garden variety thief stealing apples from the farmer's market. This was probably a lifelong career criminal, which means he probably had been in that criminal lifestyle which he was young, which, since he was young, which means that he probably was raised in a really rough environment. His father was probably a thief. His grandfather was probably a thief. This, this career criminal lifestyle probably went back generations It's probably safe to assume that he had been abused as a child. It's probably safe to assume that he had seen things in his life that would give any grown man nightmares. It was a hard knock life for this guy. Instead of treated, he got tricked. Instead of kisses, he got kicked. Oh, I thought you guys were cooler than that. Finally, imagine his life of of crime had reached a climax and led him all the way to this point where he was arrested and then sentenced to die. And I want you just to try to imagine, put yourself in the shoes of this man that you've read about, probably some of you for many years, but you've never really thought what it must have been like. Imagine the night before his crucifixion. I'm sure he didn't get a wink of sleep. Imagine the anxiety, the stress, the fear as the realization swept over him that just in a few hours, I'm about to die. And it's not just that I'm going to die. I'm going to die violently. I'm going to die at the hands of people that hate me. They are disgusted by me. And they are going to take the greatest pleasure in making this the most excruciating death imaginable for me. It's not simply going to be an execution. It's going to be a long, drawn-out, painful death. And it won't just be long and torturous. It's going to be intentionally humiliating and degrading. These guys, these Romans, are going to take me and they're going to strip me naked and spread me out in public as every passerby watches me. This guy that always personified myself as a tough guy, now I'm going to be hanging there, yapping for breath like a fish out of water, dying with eyes wide in shock, helpless and afraid. And I'm sure that it was a sleepless night, not just because of the torture that he was about to endure. It was probably a sleepless night because of the fear that he had, not only about what was coming tomorrow, but what was going to happen after he died. I mean, the fact that he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom must mean that this man believed in some kind of a life after death. And if he, if he believed in anything like hell, he surely knew that it was the only possible destination for a criminal like he was. But even more, even if he didn't believe in a hell after this life, he was in a living hell right now because he was filled with darkness in his mind and in his heart. I'm sure that that night before his crucifixion, all of the wicked deeds that he had committed over the years played in his mind like a broken record. He was full of bitterness. 
He was probably trying to justify his behavior and blame his behavior on everyone else. He blamed it on his father. He blamed it on his mother. He blamed it on his cousins. He blamed it on the government. He blamed it on the Romans. He blamed it on society, his upbringing, his environment. He passed the blame to whoever he could. He was filled with darkness and bitterness and resentment and fear. And then I want you to try to imagine, if you can, the actual day of his crucifixion. He must have been already sleep deprived and emotionally drained. And then the doors of that jail cell burst open and these strong armed Roman soldiers come and grab him and they roughly pull him out of that cell to take him to be crucified. I'm sure he was probably like all all of us sort of wired for hope, holding on to those last threads of hope, praying that a pardon would come down from the governor or some unforeseen delay would save him. Maybe he would just wake up at the last minute and realize that it had all been nothing but a terrible nightmare. But when they tied him to that whipping post and the first lash from that cat of nine tails came down on his back and ripped the tender flesh from his ribs, the shock began to set in. This is really happening. This is not a dream. I am being murdered. I'm being tortured. I'm being executed. And it's only going to get worse and worse and worse until I die. They stripped him naked. They put a a beam of wood on his shoulders and they forced him to carry it through the streets lined with people. And mind you, these were people he had known his whole life. This was his hometown. These are people he had known since he was a child. Some of those people were probably happy to see him die. Some smirked and mocked at him and spit at him. Some looked down at at the ground, ashamed that they even knew him. Some looked on him with pity. Some looked on him with disappointment. There he was in front of his own city, in his own hometown, being publicly shamed. And yet, this wasn't the worst, because he knew what awaited him at the top of that hill. He'd seen it dozens of times before. Those poor souls hanging there, lifeless. It was the worst nightmare that someone could imagine. And it was happening to him in real time. You can imagine as those nine-inch spikes were being pounded through his wrists, And the cross beam was raised up into position. Now he was suspended, hanging, every breath, sheer agony. And with the full knowledge that he was going to suffer like this for hours, maybe even days, because in those days, crucifixion could last days. And imagine the thought going through his mind as the pain raced through his body. I don't know how I can endure this for 10 more seconds, much less hours. And the Bible tells us that three men were crucified that day, the two on the ends were criminals and the one in the middle was the son of God. And those two guys on the end, those two criminals, they were guys that had things in common. You know, they were the kind of guys that would have gone to the bar together. They would have partied together. They were two tough guys. They were two men's men. They could respect one another as colleagues. And then there was this other guy in the middle. What a dork. He was this wussy religious nut I'm sure that just the presence of Jesus made this bad day even worse for those two criminals. At least those two normal guys could have been crucified next to each other, but no, they had to have this pansy hanging between them. Probably the only satisfying thing they could do was to direct some of their inner bitterness at him. The Bible says that at first, both of those men were hurling insults at Jesus. Who knows what they got out of this? Maybe just a sense of solidarity with each other by picking a common enemy. Or maybe it's just that that's what hurting people do. They instinctively hurt other people. But as the hours went on, the scripture tells us that an amazing transformation happened to that second thief. He completely changed his demeanor towards Jesus. He went from cursing him and hurling abuse at him to ultimately recognizing the one that he had abused as the Lord and then asking Jesus to receive him when he entered into his kingdom, which was an amazing statement of faith. Imagine, you know, when when Jesus was feeding the multitudes and healing the lepers and raising the dead, you could look at him and say, this man is a king. But imagine when he's hanging there bleeding and naked and looking at him across from you and recognizing him as a king and saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, this should tell us, in my estimation, a lot about 
who Jesus was. You might say, well, what can account for this incredible change? There's only one explanation. It was Jesus himself. You know, how I wish that I could have been like those disciples to be able to live with the Lord in close proximity for years, to know his personality, to know the inflection of his voice when he spoke, his mannerisms, his idiosyncrasies, his demeanor, his temperament. I think sometimes it's hard to glean all of that nonverbal information from the text when we read it, but the reality is that there was something very special about Jesus that even the worst kinds of people had to recognize. You know, one thing's for sure, if a, if a person has a holier-than-thou, judgmental, angry, indignant attitude, and you're a bad person, there's no way you're going to ask that holier-than-thou guy for help, especially if you were just cursing at him a few moments earlier. And so the fact that this man called Jesus Lord and asked him to receive him tells us a lot about who Jesus was and how he carried himself. Far from the angry, condescending way that many of Jesus' representatives a.k.a. Christians, represent themselves. Jesus held himself in such a way that it disarmed sinners. It welcomed them in. And they were won over without a rebuke or without a sermon. And that thief's reaction, if that wasn't enough to prove to you how the heart of Jesus was, then his own words show us explicitly. Think about how audacious the thief's request was. Here you have a criminal who's done nothing but hurt people his whole life, and even up until just a few minutes ago was cursing the most perfect person that ever lived, and now he wants to go to paradise. Actually, if you, if you think about it in, with a certain perspective, you might think that the thief was even less respectable for his request. At least he could take his punishment like a man here at the end and not ask for mercy. I mean... One way of looking at it would be, here this guy is with, in the last moments of his life, another selfish ambition. With his last breath, he wants something more for himself. No word of repentance, no asking for forgiveness, no requests for the victims that he hurt, no admission of guilt, just another request for himself. But here's the reality, the very fact that he was asking Jesus to remember him means that something fundamental had changed inside of his heart. Because remember what Jesus said, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. And if anyone comes to me, I will never cast him out. And so the very fact that this man came to Jesus, even though he couldn't move, but he came with his words, and he came with his heart, and he came with his faith, that was a sign that God had done a work in that man's heart. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so Jesus doesn't respond with a rebuke, but with a gentle and a wonderful promise. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Think about how amazing that promise is. Today, with me, in paradise. I mean, listen, a promise like that, even the most holy saint would be thrilled to hear, and yet these words are spoken to one of the worst sinners. But here again, Jesus had said that he would never refuse anyone who came to him. You know, there were scribes, there were Pharisees, there were doctors of the law, there were good religious law-abiding citizens that came under God's judgment because they wouldn't come to Jesus. And then you have this thief hanging on a cross who receives a total pardon because he did one good thing in his entire life. He came to Jesus. Isn't that amazing? What a thought. Now, you know, there's a debate that's been raging for a long time about the meaning of several of the verses in John chapter 6 where we have that scripture, he that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. Some people have said that the ones that come to Jesus are part of a special group. They're part of what is called the elect. And they are a group of people that have been predestined to be saved. And if you're part of this group, God will draw you in a way that you will not be able to resist. And if he doesn't do that to you, you won't be able to come to him at, at all. And they believe that because of verses like, just looking at this one chapter, ver, chapter six of John, verse 37. Again, Jesus said, all the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So they say, the ones that the Father gives to Jesus are the predestined ones. Then there's verse 44. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So they say this verse means that God won't let just anybody come to Jesus. It's only for a select few. And then there's verse 65, which, where Jesus says, this is why I told you that no one can come to me 
unless the Father has enabled them. So they say that this verse means that God has selected some people for salvation while he excludes the rest. But then there's all of these other texts, not only throughout the New Testament, but in John chapter 6 itself, that seem to tell us something else. Like verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Whoever comes to me. There's verse 40, Jesus says, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. There's verse 47, Jesus said, truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Verse 54, Jesus said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And so who's right and who's wrong? Well, I'm not going to get into that debate tonight. I'd like to, I'm very tempted to. If you want to hear what I have to say about it, come to the boot camp. Those of you that have been in the boot camp know exactly what I think about it. But here is the important point. You see, it actually doesn't matter which of those perspectives is right and which is wrong because at at the end of the day, the result is the same. The important point is that Jesus said, if anyone comes to him, he will never cast them away. And so are the ones that come to him, are they individuals that were predestined for salvation? Are they being irresistibly drawn or could they choose not to come? Did God have some reason for choosing them or is it completely arbitrary? Either way, the point is the same. If you come to him, he won't resist you. And even more importantly, the very desire that you have to come to him is something that he has initiated inside of you. You wouldn't even have the desire to come to him if he weren't drawing you. So listen, if you have the desire to come to Jesus, Here's the good news. That is a gift from God. It's certainly not something that your sinful flesh and your your sinful nature has inspired in you. It's certainly not the devil creating that desire within you. If you have the desire to come to God, that desire is a gift itself from God. And there's no way that God would draw you to himself and then send you away. And so even the desire that you have to come to him is in some way a kind of guarantee that when you do come to him, he will receive you. Isn't that amazing? And in fact, if there's any question, listen to what Jesus said in John 12, 32. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Let me just read that again in case you didn't hear it. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw how many people? All people unto me. So let me ask you tonight. What excuse do you have for not coming to Jesus? Have you sinned more than that criminal that was worthy of the most severe punishment in Roman law? Do you have less to offer Jesus than a man whose hands and feet were nailed down and had only a few breaths left? Do you think he's more angry with you than he was with a man hurling vulgar profanities at him as he was being tortured? Listen to me, my friends. Our greatest need in life is to come to Jesus. We need to come to him more than we need to be holy. We need to come to him more than we need to start doing the right things and stop doing the wrong things. We need to come to him more than we need to go to church. We need to come to him more than we need to read our Bible or practice all the spiritual disciplines. You know, for believers, sometimes after we've blown it, we go through a period of sulking and wallowing in shame. Sometimes we don't feel worthy Sometimes we feel like a hypocrite if we worship or pray or witness or say something spiritual or act confident. And the devil sort of sends us running away like a puppy with our tail between our legs. We go off like Adam and Eve hiding from the presence of the Lord. But here's the reality. Jesus makes the promise that if you come to me today, I will not refuse you under any circumstances. It is not only an invitation, it is a requirement that we come to him. You see, religion causes us to hide from him. But Jesus welcomes us to run to him when we've sinned. Would you stand with me tonight? I'm asking the worship team to come back out and I want to, I think it would be very appropriate for us tonight to give the opportunity to anyone who senses that drawing in their heart. Listen to me, if you feel the slightest tug from the Holy Spirit, maybe you're away from the Lord tonight, like the prodigal son who ran away from his father's house and wasted his 
substance on riotous living. I feel that word just in my spirit, the word prodigal. For every prodigal here tonight, I believe Jesus is calling you home on this day that we celebrate his death on the cross. Can I tell you why he died? He died for you. And if you'd been the only person that ever lived, he still would have died to save you. That's how much he loves you. You know, there's this, when I was reading through the, the story of the crucifixion in the four gospels, something jumped out at me. I, I noticed that in every one of the accounts, it gives this one interesting detail. It says that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, they were hurling insults on him and they were, at him and they were saying, come down from the cross. And they were making this mockery. They were saying, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Every one of the gospels mentions that, that people said to him, he saved others, but he could not save himself. And it occurred to me, do you know why he could not save himself? Because he was there to save others. If he had saved himself, then he could not have saved that thief on the cross. If he had saved himself, then he could not save you. But it was because he did not save himself. It's because he died that you can be saved. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, I want to ask you a question tonight. If you need Jesus to save you tonight, if you're away from the Lord, if you're backslidden, if you're lost, if there's darkness in your heart, some of you are in that place that the, that the thief was in of a, a living hell going on inside of you. Jesus can save you. He can wash you clean. He can break your chains. He can set you free. And if you want that to happen to you tonight, I want to pray with you. So just lift your hands wherever you are in this place. I can see you. Come on, this is so amazing. I'm going to ask you to do something bold tonight. I want you to get out of your seat wherever you are. If that's what you want to do, if you want to make that prayer, I want you to get out of your seat and come right here and stand in the front of this room. This is going to be like a, from now on for the rest of your life, this is going to be like the anniversary day of the day that you made that decision to follow Jesus. Come on. Come on. Those of you that raise your hands, don't be shy. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Prayer team, come. Prayer team, come. Bless you, my friend. You're so welcome. Here's what I'm going to do. I know that, that so many of you that raise your hands sometimes it just feels a little bit scary to make a, a move like that. But let me tell you, for, for those of you that might be new to this environment, there's a reason that I'm asking you to come. Jesus said that if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. But he said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. It's a very important statement. There is something about that, that when you express with your own body the decision that you're making. It's not just something in the quiet recesses of your heart. It's something you're willing to live out. And I'll tell you another reason why you do it. Because when you make that step out of that place where you're sitting or standing, and you make those few steps forward, I'll tell you the eyes of heaven see, but I'll tell you there's some other eyes that see, and it's the devil. And you're making a statement to the devil that I don't belong to you anymore. I am leaving your camp. I'm leaving your team. I'm switching sides. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. From this day forward, I belong to Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to ask every person in the sound of my voice to turn to the person on your right and your left. And I want you to say to them, do you need to be down at that altar? If they say yes, I want you to take them by the hand and come with them. Do it right now. Turn to the one on your right and your left. I don't care how good they look. I don't care how nice they smell. I don't care if they sing on the worship team. Say, do you need to be down there at that altar? If they say yes, go ahead, take them by the hand. Step out into that aisle and come down here right now. Come on, let's put our hands together for those that are coming. We welcome you. Jesus' name. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. Thank you, Jesus. Is there, could there be anything better on Good Friday than people being washed in the blood of Jesus? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. 
So here's what we're gonna do. Those of you that, are in, that have come to the altar, God bless you, my friend. Those of you that have come here, I'm gonna pray with you. Counselors, just, just hold off for a moment, please. Counselors, just hold off. We're gonna pray together corporately, and then I want you guys to pray individually with each one, okay? And here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna lead us all in a prayer of salvation. Now listen, it's, this is not some magical uh, enchantment or something. These words that I'm speaking to you, they don't even come out of the Bible. I'm just making them up. There's nothing magical about the words. In fact, I would even go so far as to say Jesus isn't even really listening to the words. He's listening to the heart behind the words. And so all I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put my arm around you and I'm going to help you to call upon the name of the Lord. And this is the promise that we find in Scripture that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All right, so we're gonna pray this together and I don't want you to whisper, I want you to pray from the bottom of your heart. I'm asking everyone in this room to pray with me in support of those that are praying for the first time. Are you ready? Come on, lift your hands to heaven. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight, a sinner needing salvation. Lord Jesus Christ, I cannot save myself. I need you. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, save me now. I confess with my mouth when I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for me, that He rose from the dead for me. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to me. I believe it. I receive it. I confess it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give a mighty clap for Jesus tonight.
and pray with everyone that has come. I want to also say, if you just need prayer in your life, you need a healing, maybe you need a breakthrough, you need someone to agree with you, the altar team is going to stay up here for the next few minutes to pray with you. But for everyone else, we want to thank you so much for coming tonight. And of course, Sunday, please bring family, bring friends. We're making room for you with three services. We'd love to see you then. It's going to be an amazing, and amazing Easter resurrection service morning. We love you guys. God bless you. Those that are watching online, thank you so much for joining us. Go with the grace and the power of Jesus Christ. Come on, let's continue to worship as those that come for prayer. Altars are still open, church. If you need prayer, please come. Altars are open. You're worthy. 